On a blustery February day in southern France, a group gathers in this cemetery. They are here not to grieve for a recently departed loved one, but to mourn the loss of the former French colony of Algeria and to remember those who resorted to violence to keep it French. That bloody eight-year struggle failed, and in 1962, Algeria gained independence from France. But more than four decades on, La Guerre Sans Nom, or the war without a name, as it's been known here, still evokes complex feelings. Not least for the one and a half million French veterans who fought in it. Some feel shame and regret, others bitterness and anger. I lost a part of my life. I lost my mother. I lost everything, everything. And today, I look at the French people and see that they have no answers to those of us who have suffered. Algeria, Africa's second largest country, was colonized by the French in the 19th century. But unlike the neighboring French protectorates of Tunisia or Morocco, Algeria was considered French territory, legally a mere extension of mainland France itself. And by the mid-20th century, it was home to over a million European settlers. While they enjoyed the privileges of French citizenship, the overwhelming majority of the population, Arab and Berber Muslims, reaped few benefits from the French presence. The majority of the native population didn't have the same rights as those held by a French citizen. There was a contradiction between those supposedly egalitarian republican principles that France was supposed to be importing to Algeria as a colony and the reality. In 1954, a group of Algerians determined to end France's colonial rule and achieve independence turned to violence. On November the 1st, the recently formed FLN, or National Liberation Front, launched attacks across Algeria against French military and civilian targets. For the French authorities in Paris, the FLN's aim of independence for Algeria was unthinkable. Troops were sent in to clamp down on what was regarded as mere civil unrest. And even as the violent rebellion escalated in the coming months into an all-out conflict, France refused to admit it was entering into war. War can only take place when two clearly distinct national groups are concerned. Calling it a war meant admitting that Algeria wasn't France. Algeria may have been considered part of France, but for those on the mainland, the violence engulfing it often seemed distant. Je ne suis pas... I wasn't really interested in what was happening in Algeria. I was mainly bound up with myself, sports, friends. I had a completely ordinary life. But Jean-Pierre's life was soon to be touched by events across the Mediterranean Sea. Every Frenchman had to carry out military service. We owed it to the state. If we didn't, we were considered traitors, cowards. So one day, I received an official letter calling me up, and I went, just like that, without asking myself too many questions. But on arriving in Algeria, uncomfortable questions about the French mission were difficult to suppress. On one side were the few Europeans living in the region that had a lot of money. On the other was the Algerian population, which had almost nothing. This meant that I started asking myself questions concerning their reasons for rebelling, wondering whether their action was in fact justified. Many young soldiers sent to Algeria were deployed to villages in the countryside to root out FLN influence at any cost. Two or three other soldiers and I found ourselves face to face with two FLN fighters. Guns were fired on either side, and they were wounded. I stopped shooting to wait for reinforcements. Then other soldiers arrived, and one simply killed one of the FLN fighters. I'll never forget that. It remains an open wound. 
Other veterans too remain traumatized by the scenes they witnessed as young conscripts. To this day I still dream of disgusting scenes. For example, at the end of an operation, we'd captured some prisoners. They weren't dead, but we had to do something with them. I have in my mind, it's not voluntary, the image of our special forces just gawking at them with disgust, and then going to have a beer. Then some harkies were paid to come along and cut the prisoners' throats with kitchen knives. The word harki has come to have the derogatory connotation traitor, but it originally referred to the Muslim Algerian forces that were recruited by the French to fight against the independence movement. Abdel Qader Hamoumou was one. He says he joined the French after the FLN tried to kill his father and claims that neither side had a monopoly on savagery. I once saw an old woman and I was sure the FLN would kill her because she had insulted them. A few days later, I went with my mother to collect feed for our animals and I found a piece of flesh. I showed it to my mother and she told me it was a piece of the old woman's skin. Despite an increasing number of troops and tactics which included the forced resettlement of large swathes of the population, the French proved unable to crush the independence movement. And at the end of 1956, the FLN hardened its stance, launching a campaign of urban attacks, which inaugurated a new chapter in the war, to be known as the Battle of Algiers. Bombs were planted in student bars in which there were young Algerians, not just French people. And an exploded bomb means people wounded, killed, blood, fear. Such bombings were often carried out by Algerian women dressed in Western clothes, a tactic which sent the European settler population into hysteria. France reacted harshly, deploying its 10th parachute division headed by General Jacques Massou to Algiers in an attempt to prevent any further attacks and stop a general strike called by the FLN to garner international attention to the independence cause. General Paul Asares reported directly to General Massou. We heard that the independence movement of Algeria they would organize a strike. The governor and General Massé agreed that we would stop that strike at any price. You understand, at any price. That price included degrading forms of torture practiced by General Massou's parachute division as they swept the streets of Algiers' ancient Muslim quarter, the Kasbah, in an attempt to identify and break FLN cells. I gave orders to, to get any possible information. So some of the people in charge, you torture, I knew the Arpachet torture, yes, I knew. But I found it was better to have some results even by torture. General Asores insists that the coercive methods of interrogation, including torture, were sanctioned at the highest levels of the French state. Every night I made a report of what I had done and I did not hide anything, anything. Every morning I gave the copy of what I had done to General Massu. And the same day that copy was sent to the government without changing a word. Many were appalled at the measures that France the country of liberty, equality and fraternity was undertaking within its own territory. Aujourd'hui, les autorités françaises reconnaissent qu'il y avait la guerre. 
Today, the French authorities admit that a war took place. At the time, they refused to. So these prisoners didn't fall under the Geneva Convention. What's more, they weren't even entitled to the same rights as ordinary citizens. Basically, they were outside the law. Monsieur Vergès is today one of France's most controversial lawyers, famous for his defense of international criminals, such as Carlos the Jackal. But he began his career defending FLN suspects, an action undertaken, he claims, to raise attention in France itself to the systematic abuse of human rights being carried out in its name. Because Algeria was the place of crimes affreux. Appalling crimes were committed in Algeria that no one knew about. Events were hushed up. Court cases were the only way of denouncing these crimes publicly, the only way of denouncing torture. Through an unrelenting show of force and the widespread torture of FLN suspects, the French eventually claimed victory in the Battle of Algiers. Attacks declined and the streets of the capital became safe once again for Europeans. But just as the army was claiming military success, politically, the tide was turning. For as news spread of the heavy-handed measures being employed by France, opinion began to shift towards the independence movement, both internationally and even among some in France itself. I did my best to let people know what was happening in the Algerian war by writing articles about my experiences as a soldier. And this contributed to the protests against torture that were gaining currency in France. In 1958, a constitutional crisis erupted. A military junta seizes control in Algiers. As generals in Algiers launched a military coup, determined to return to power General Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle had been the leader of the French resistance to the Nazi occupation in World War II. His supporters among the army and the European settlers of Algeria now calculated that only he would have the metal to preserve French rule in Algeria. But they were to be bitterly disappointed. On July the 5th, 1962, and after 132 years of French colonial rule, Algeria was declared an independent nation. The joy of its people was hard to contain. For the path to independence had been a bloody eight-year war that had led to the loss of up to a million Algerian lives. That war was prolonged by a breakaway group of hardliners known as the Organization of the Secret Army, or the OAS, which brought France itself to the verge of civil war in its attempt to keep Algeria French at all costs. The OAS was a major threat. It wasn't a sideshow. This was a war within a war. And indeed, de Gaulle was almost killed several times in direct attacks. The activities of the OAS against both French and Algerian targets accentuated the intercommunal tensions in Algeria, which boiled over as independence grew near, endangering the future of the European settlers. One day I was on the building site where I worked. Two Algerians came asking for a job. I told them there wasn't any work and to try somewhere else. I went into the office and one of them closed the door. He was two meters away holding a gun, telling me not to move. I went at him and we fought. He didn't fire, but I got beaten around the head. It was after that that my father forced me to leave for France. In the two months after independence, around one and a half million European settlers abandoned their homes in Algeria following a series of massacres against them. You mustn't forget that hundreds of thousands of Algerians died in that war. It's fundamental. Every Algerian family was affected by the war, the cruelty, the violence, the tragedy. And the desire for vengeance existed. You can't sit back calmly when your whole family is being killed. Many Europeans settled in France, often arriving here at the southern port of Marseille. 
I remember myself waiting in the queue at 5 in the morning to get a ticket for the boat. For me, it was temporary. I never expected that I stay in France all my life. For Algeria, independence did not mean peace. Often plagued by political violence, it has taken a course that has held no place for Europeans like Georges. Like many, he settled on France's Mediterranean coast, across the sea from what was once his home. While nostalgic for the life he once had there, he respects the right of Algerians to self-determination. But not all veterans are so accepting. These men and women are gathering for a meeting of what's called the Association for the Defense of Former Prisoners and Exiles of French Algeria. Most were former OAS members, and more than four decades on, they remain firm in their belief that France should never have given up Algeria. My biggest regret is that people don't recognize de Gaulle's betrayal. There's no reason to put on a pedestal the one who betrayed France. We'll forget once everyone has recognized de Gaulle's betrayal, but we'll never forgive him. Few French have much sympathy for former OAS members like these and their claims of betrayal. The ill treatment of another group of French veterans, however, is undoubted. The 150,000 Algerian Muslims who fought for France and who are still referred to as Arkis. Ahead of independence, they were forcibly disarmed by the French army, who stood by as thousands were tortured and killed by Algerian independence fighters who regarded them as traitors. One day, I saw an Arki from the area running towards the village, screaming because a number of Algerians had tried to cut his throat. He had escaped, but was bleeding from the neck and was beside himself in pain and fear. But my captain said to him, listen, we can't help you. We've liberated you. You're no longer part of the French army. You've got to leave. Unlike the European settlers, and despite the clear danger to their lives, Algerians who had fought for France were forbidden from immigrating to the former colonial power. But through the kindness of individual French commanders, several thousand were illegally smuggled into France. On arrival, they were confined to primitive rural camps. This is the site of such a camp in which these men used to live. It was finally demolished only in 1995. In the camp we lived communally, without any relation to the outside world. No French kids were with us. We were Arabs and didn't know what racism was. It was only when I was in college that racism came along. We were treated differently, always put at the back of the class. And we found it very difficult to find jobs. Today, former residents of the camps remain a tight-knit community. They continue to demand recognition for France's responsibility for their plight. They said we were there to defend Republican values, and then they left us without arms to our destiny. We want France to admit its responsibility for those of us who died in Algeria and for our abandonment in France. For some, the memory of Algeria is still painful. I won't go back. I won't go. Of course, my family's there and I'd love to see them. But I'm scared. I'm really scared I'll be killed. It's my country, but I can never go back. Decades on, enmities from the war in Algeria continue to haunt the Algerians who fought for France and their descendants. Their fate has been curiously intertwined with that of post-independence Algeria. For several million Algerians have immigrated to France, the former colonial power they fought in search of better economic opportunities. These Algerians have never forgiven what many regard as the treachery of their countrymen who chose to side with the French against the independence movement. And in the suburbs of Paris and Marseille, 
where much of the Algerian immigrant community is concentrated, Alki remains a dirty word. At one time, we lived in an area of Marseille full of Algerian immigrants. And when I used to play, my mother would put her finger on her mouth, telling me never to mention that we were Arkis. Because there was still that fear that even here, in France, we'd be killed. Following the war, the French state was quick to draw a line under it. An amnesty was put in place for all crimes committed during the war, and for decades, it was veiled in official silence. Only in 1999, and partly under pressure from the Algerian immigrant community, did the National Assembly officially admit that a war had taken place. And this small monument was erected on the banks of the River Seine. But it was in the year 2000 that the silence surrounding the war was well and truly shattered. General Paul Osores published a book in which he admitted his part in the systematic torture that was practiced by the French during the Battle of Algiers. I believe General Alcérès committed war crimes in Algeria, crimes against humanity. But his book shows that he committed these crimes under orders from members of the government. He carried out the orders. But the people above him were quite simply able to bury the past. And they continued to bury the past by putting General Osores and his publishers on trial in order to suppress the book and convicting them of condoning war crimes. For many, Osores is the scapegoat of a nation still unable to face up to its own responsibility for the conduct of the war in Algeria. A war in which the French values of liberty, equality and fraternity were badly compromised and which continues to cast a dark shadow over France's relationship with its own Muslim community. Osores himself, however, remains unrepentant. The middle of the time trial, the lawyer said, listen, if you say the word regret, there will be no trial, no trial. I said, listen, no, I cannot say that. I cannot say that. No. I will not say I regret. There is a song of Edith Piaf. No, rien de rien. No, je ne regrette rien. That's my song, you know. I don't regret. I didn't like, but I don't regret. <laughs>